Hello and welcome back to Guided Hacking, this is Fred HK and today we're going to be taking a look at more anti-debugging techniques. The techniques we'll be taking a look at today will make use of structured exception handling and anti-debug mechanisms. So when you want to write secure code and protect it from people from debugging, you will want to use something like structured exception handling to be able to gracefully handle and recover from exceptions. So whenever there's an error within your code, you can recover from that exception that it will throw and continue with the execution of that code. And we can abuse this to implement anti-debug techniques so that attackers can't go through and read your code or analyze it. So we'll be taking a look at how we can use register flags to throw an exception, and then we can abuse the SEH, which is the structured exception handling, to detect debuggers. And we'll do this within C or C++ as they support SEH, and it's proved pretty trivial to get this to work with C++ in combinations with a few lines of assembly. But first, we need to understand trap flags. So what is a trap flag? Well, let's start by defining what a flag register is. In the x86 architecture, the flags register, as you can see here within x32 debug, is also known as the eFlags register. And it's a special register that contains status flags, and these reflect the outcome of arithmetic or logical operations. And this will provide information about the current state of the processor and is used for conditional branching and decision making within the program. This video was brought to you by AnyRun. AnyRun offers a cloud-based interactive malware analysis sandbox accessible directly from your browser. The sandbox allows you to upload your own malware samples or browse through those which have been publicly uploaded. Let's check out this zip file which was publicly analyzed and deemed malicious. We can scroll through the screenshots recorded during the initial analysis, look at network connections, and more. Over in the processes, we can see some commands being run on behalf of the user. And clicking on the text report gives us a full rundown of all the activities any run has flagged as malicious. The team also recently added support for Linux, ensuring analysis capabilities across a wide range of malware samples. In addition to malware analysis, AnyRun is now offering a new threat intelligence platform, which enables defenders to do things such as search IOCs, look at real-world events, and map C2 locations. You can try AnyRun now by visiting any.run and signing up for free with a business email account. That's ANY.RUN, and you can sign up for all these features free. Thank you to AnyRun for sponsoring this video. So any branches or jumps we'll see will usually depend on the results from this flags within here. The flags register contains numerous different individual flags. This will include the carry flag, the zero flag, the sign flag, overflow flag, and a few others as well. But we're interested in the trap flag, TF, here on number eight. This flag is a single bit flag that controls the operation of single step debugging. And then when it's set, the processor will enter the single step mode. And in this mode, the processor executes instructions one at a time as if we were stepping through in a debugger. And it will generate a trap after each instruction. Like in previous videos, we looked at how breakpoints work by the debugger throwing an int one exception. This is done as well so that you can step through the program. And this feature is commonly used by debuggers. Let's go on to structured exception handling. So structured exception handling looks somewhat like this if you were to put it into a flowchart. And it's a very common paradigm within programming. We start our program and then we go into a try block where we'll try to execute code. If the code fails and an exception occurs, then we'll catch it and we'll continue the execution. But if the code doesn't throw any errors, then we'll just continue with our execution. And this is a structured way of handling potential errors within our code. Within the flowchart, we can see that we will first start by setting a trap flag. And then after the trap flag is set, we will see that the code will throw an exception. So if a debugger is attached to the program, then that exception will be handled by the debugger's handler. And this is so that the, as mentioned before, the debugger can handle exceptions so that it can step through one instruction at a time. But if the exception is thrown and no debugger is attached, then a normal exception handler will be called. So we can write code that will discern between the two, and if a debugger is attached, then we can act accordingly. After these handlers have finished, then the execution of the code is finished. So let's move on to how we can do this in practice. Looking at the code that's responsible for how we can pull this off, we see that we first import a few libraries, we define an epilogue, which I'll discuss later, and then we go into our anti-debug function. Within the anti-debug function, we start off within a try block, and then we'll call it some inline assembly to set up our trap flag. And this is done by first calling push FD. And this will allow us to set the flags register because they can't be changed directly. But we can do this by pushing it to the stack so that 
you can do what you want and then pop it back into the register. And this is done by XORing with the correct mask. And then you can set arbitrary field in the register. So when you XOR with 100, the trap flag is set because it's in the eighth fit in the flag register. And this is what the assembly here will do. So it will trigger our trap flag within the register. Then because that will throw an exception, if the code continues, then we'll see that our message box of debugger is present will be called because we're not going into the finally block because the debugger is handling the exception. But there, if there is no debugger, then the finally block will be called. So why do we use try and finally? This is a standard way of using structured exception handling in C++. And another way to define it would be using try and accept. But inside the try block, we insert the code and that will throw the exception. But since debuggers handle exceptions in their way, in case our code is running under debugging environment, it will reach the finally block. We exploit this behavior to then detect if there is a presence of debugger. So going on to the epilogue. So we'll define a custom epilogue that will override the epilogue of the try finally statement. So this is overwriting the co normal code that you'd find in C++. And this will prevent the finally from being executed after the try block because the function returns directly to main instead. It's also responsible for returning us back to main after execution of the finally block without it getting a stack corruption and app crash. So this method will substitute our try accept in case it doesn't work. So how would you go ahead and bypass this? Well, what you can do is you can patch out some of the code within here to remove that pushing of the trap code, which we can see here. So we can just remove this code here or we can completely remove the call to the function as well. I hope that this was a good overview of how we can use SEH as an anti-debugging trick. Until the next one, goodbye. If you enjoyed this video, a like would help a lot and subscribe to be notified of future uploads. If you haven't already, check out guidedhacking.com for a step-by-step -step introduction to game hacking and an ever-growing catalogue of content. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.